follow, it means to either conform, comply, or act in accordance with, to literally imitate or to copy. So then why do we think when Jesus said, follow me, he meant raise a hand, sign a card, or show up at church once a week? When Jesus said, follow me, he wanted people who imitated him, who conformed to him, who looked like him. He wanted us to drop everything, radically change our lives, and yield to the unknown. He wanted us to follow, to go where he goes, to do what he does, because he's bringing his kingdom, and the only thing he asks is, will we follow? Good to worship with you again. We started this new series called Following Christ last week, um, and we are trying to answer the question, what does that look like? Where do I even start in my life? If that is something that I truly want to pursue, where do I begin? What does that look like for us in Norman, Oklahoma, and where we live? And so hopefully, over the next few weeks, we're going to be able to answer this question and other questions that have to uh, revolve around this topic and this question. We are going to be in Philippians chapter 2 again today, so if you have your Bibles, feel free to, to turn there. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, I would love to encourage you to come find me or Brad after the service is over. Uh, we have hard copy Bibles that we buy just to give away, and we would love, love to give you one of those so that you can have one and take it home so that you can have a copy of God's word with you. And like I said, we give them away. That means they are F-R-E-E, free. And so just come find myself or Brad or one of our leaders, and we would love to do that. Before we get to Philippians chapter 2 today, uh, I want to ask this question and, and throw this out there. Have you ever had somebody in your life that you look up to as an example of how you want to live your life? Think about that person in your mind right now. Surely there's somebody that you grew up looking up to, or maybe it's even somebody that you've met in the last six months to a year, next the last two years or so, that, man, you watch them, you observe their life, and they're doing it right, or, or you, want, you like the way they're doing it, and you want to follow that. Does anybody have somebody like that? Give me head nods if you're in with me on this one. Okay, here's what I want to do. On the count of three, I want you to shout their name at me, all right? Can we do that? You've got somebody in your mind that, you, that you're thinking about? Okay, one, two, three. Dad. <laughs> All right, I heard dad. That's good. All right, um, that's good, yeah. Uh, everybody has somebody that they're looking at, somebody that they have seen as an example that they want to follow. That's just what we've grown up with. Or that's, that's what we've seen and, and encountered in our lives. For me, it was very simple. There were two men in my life that I looked at and I knew I wanted to be like them. Our students have heard me say this before, but the two men in my life were my dad and my youth minister. They showed me what it was like to be a godly family man, and that's something that I wanted to do and I wanted to emulate in my life. When people would say, who are your heroes or who is your hero? I would say, I, I'm cheating. I have two, and that's, that's who it was. I was very fortunate to have that. We all have somebody that we look up to, though, somebody that, we ha that has set forth an example, and today in our passage, we're going to see some men who have set the example for us. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, it will be on the screen for you as well to follow along, but we want to make sure everybody can read God's Word. But Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 19, and we're going to read about 11 or 12 verses today. So let's, let's unpack, and here we go. <clears throat> if the Lord Jesus is willing, I hope to send Timothy to you soon for a visit. Then he can cheer me up by telling me how you, how you are getting along. I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. All the others care only for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. But you, but you know how Timothy has proved himself. Like a son with his father, he has served with me in preaching the good news. I hope to send him to you just as soon as I find out what is going to happen to me here. And I have confidence from the Lord that I myself will come to see you soon. Now, you get the sense from reading this passage and all throughout the letter of Philippians um, that Paul genuinely and deeply cares about Timothy and he deeply cares about this church, okay? He cares about their welfare. He cares about what's going on. That's why he says, I hope to be encouraged by hearing about what's going on with you and hearing that you were getting along, okay? He wants to know about them, and there's this ongoing relationship with them, okay? So you get this sense. Verse 25, 
He says, meanwhile, he says, I hope to send Timothy and I hope that you can do that. But meanwhile, verse 25, I thought I should send Epaphroditus. That's just a fun name to say, right? Epaphroditus, all right? Epaphroditus, back to you. He is a true brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier. And he was your messenger to help me in my need. I am sending him because he has been longing to see you. And he was very distressed that uh, you heard he was ill. So here's what's happening. Paul's writing this letter in, uh, to the Philippian church from prison in Rome, all right? And what happens is the people in Philippi hear that Paul is in Rome, so they just gather up this resource stuff because they know he's in Rome, they know he's in prison, so they know that he can't provide really for himself a whole lot. And so they want to send him a gift, a monetary gift, so that he can continue to do ministry there, so that he can continue to spread the gospel, so that he can continue to tell the people that Jesus loves them and wants a relationship with them. So the the Philippians, they gather up all this stuff and they send a group to go see Paul with this monetary gift. Well, on the way, Epaphroditus gets sick. We don't know what from or what it was, but it says that he almost died. And so they were kind of scared. And so what probably happened was, is they decided, you know what? Let's keep going with Epaphroditus and let's get him to Rome so that way we can get him some medicine and get him taken care of. Let's send one or two of our people back to Philippi so that way they can tell them what's happening with Epaphroditus and pray for him and lift him up, all right? And so they have heard that what's going on. So Epaphroditus gets back to Rome, or gets to Rome, he gets better, and then they start to send him back. And he's really worried that, man, you guys heard I was sick and I'm okay, but I'm all right. And so they've been praying for him. And this is kind of what we see has been happening here, okay? Verse 27. And he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died. Sorry, I gave it away. He almost died. But God had mercy on him and also on me so that I would not have one sorrow after another. This is what Paul is saying right here. (laughs) I'm in prison. I'm falsely accused. And it's just one thing after another. It's just not going right. I'm so glad God spared him because my friend Epaphroditus, I didn't want him to die. I wanted to make sure that he was okay. I'm so glad God spared him. Not only did he have mercy in the fact that Epaphroditus got to live and he had mercy on him, but it was God was blessing me in that he didn't let me lose another friend, lose somebody that I cared about. Verse 28. So I am all the more anxious to send him back to you, for I know you will be glad to see him, and then I will not be worried about you. Verse 29. Welcome him in the Lord's love with great joy, and give him the honor that people like him deserve. For he risked his life for the work of Christ, and he, wa- and he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do from far away. Okay, There's a couple of things that I want us to, to focus in on uh, today that I think can be life-changing for us if we'll let them be. If we'll let the power of the Spirit, the power of the Bible change our lives today, I think it can happen. Okay, So number one, if you're taking notes, this is the first thing that I want us to focus in on. As followers of Jesus, we are called to be servants of the gospel, okay? As followers of Jesus, we are called to be servants of the gospel. These men, Timothy, Epaphroditus, I knew I'd mess it up once, Epaphroditus and Paul were all called to be servants of the gospel. They served Jesus with their lives. And in that time and in that era, they were living examples of what a follower of Jesus was looks like, okay? Take Timothy for a moment. Think about him for a minute. Timothy met Paul. Paul, um, we'll get to him in just a second. Timothy met Paul on one of his, on his first missionary journey. Timothy heard, and, and based on from what he had had from his grandmother and his mother, had already believed and decided, you know what? I want to join this guy. And so he joined Paul on his mission, the rest of his missionary journey. Timothy left his father, his mother, and his grandmother in Lystra, which is now modern Turkey, and said, I'm going to follow this guy, Paul, and I'm going to go all over the world with him, and I'm going to spread the, news, the, the good news of Jesus. Well, we know from the scriptures that Paul didn't have just one missionary journey. He had multiple missionary journeys, and Timothy was there, okay? Timothy was also the guy who, you've heard of the book of Ephesians in, in the Bible? He was the pastor of the church of Ephesus, okay? And Timothy was also the guy who is in First and Second Timothy. Paul's writing him a letter on helping him pastor that church. So Timothy was a servant of the gospel, followed Paul, gave up everything to go and to do that. We know Epaphroditus, he lived in Philippi, okay? 
He, they found out that Paul was in prison and knowing that he's not able to provide for himself anymore because they know that Paul was a tent maker and they know that he could provide for himself and do things like that. But if he's in prison, he can't do that anymore. So Epaphroditus, along with the people of Philippi, decide, you know what, we're gonna gather things up and we're gonna go and give this gift to Paul so that he can continue to do ministry, so that he can continue to spread the news, the good news of the gospel. Now, we think about that, and that's, that's kind of a neat thing and, and kind of a, a cool thing that they're doing, but what we don't realize is they didn't have cars back then. They didn't have airplanes that you could just jump in and go and be there four or five hours later, however long, you know, whatever the flight was. They got most of the way, the, where they were going by foot. And in doing research, Rome is over here, and Philippi is well over a thousand miles away. Epaphroditus hears what's going on with Paul and decides, you know what? The gospel needs to be spread in Rome. Let's gather this up. Let's go. And not only that, we see from the scriptures that he almost died on his way to do this. This was a big deal to him, but he was willing to give his life for the sake of the gospel. Paul, in prison because he's spreading the gospel, okay? People didn't like it, so they put him in jail. Paul, we know from his life that he was once somebody who persecuted Christians. He arrested them, and he even stood by while people were hurling stones at Stephen. And Paul was the guy who was like, hey guys, take your coats off. Put your coats over here by me. That way you can really get into it and throw the stone and get him. Paul was one of those people, all right? Paul was on his way to Damascus to arrest more Christians, we read the story in Acts chapter 9. He meets Jesus. Boom, his life has changed forever. And now, Paul is a servant of the gospel. Paul gave up his life of what he was doing, did a complete 180 to serve the gospel. These three men set forth an example for us that we are called to be servants of the gospel. There are any any. Gentiles in here? Any Gentiles in this room? Okay. In, in, in the Bible world, there are Jewish people and then there are Gentile people. So if you're not Jewish in here, you're Gentile, all right? So we're all Gentiles in here, right? You've heard about the gospel because of Paul. Paul's calling on his life was to take the good news, the message of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Oh, and another thing that Paul also did, he wrote almost half of the New Testament of our Bible that we have. It's divided into two sections, Old and New Testament. There are 27 books in the New Testament. Paul wrote 12 or 13 of them. <laughs> we have all of that because Paul gave up his life because Jesus Christ encountered him and he experienced salvation in that. And he became a servant of the gospel. We, as followers of Jesus, are called to be servants of the the gospel. The second thing that we can see in this passage and, and that, that I want us to focus on in here is this. We are called to serve each other. Just like these three men were called to be servants of the gospel, they were called to be servants of each other, okay? The Philippian church was there for Paul, and Paul had established that church among the people of Philippi on one of his missionary journeys, and there was a bond there Paul had a definite soft spot in his heart for them. There was a relationship. And we see that in the scriptures that it's such a good relationship that Paul even talks about them to another church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he mentions them. They are serving each other. And here's the thing. When the Philippian church heard about Paul, they gathered up the money, right? They said, we're going to send this monetary gift and we're going to go. And it's, it doesn't matter if it's over a thousand miles away. There's no mention of, you know what? This is over a thousand miles away. And by the way, that's if they chose to go across the Adriatic Sea as opposed to around it. If they went around it, it was well over 1,500 miles. <laughs> There's no mention of, this is going to take us like a couple of months to get there. Man, if, if we're booking it, we can get there in like two months. Is it even going to be worth it? Is he still going to need it? Is he going to be alive? Is he still going to be okay? We don't see any mention of those questions or anything like that. It's just our fellow Christian, our fellow brother in Christ is in jail. He's spreading the gospel. 
Let's gather up and let's go. Let's mount up and let's get out there because he needs us. And Paul, sitting there in a jail cell, they get to him. And remember, he's writing this letter back to them now. Like they've already given him the gift and they've made their way across. Paul is writing this letter back to them saying, this guy, these people, Timothy and Epaphroditus, when Epaphroditus gets back to you, give him your love in the Lord. Give him the reception that he deserves because we are there for one another. We follow Christ and Christ's example was to be there for the church, okay? Paul would even tell the people in Galatians, Galatians chapter six, verses nine and 10. So let us not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Now, verse 10, this is the one that I really like, okay? So don't get tired in doing good because that's important. Why? Therefore, verse 10, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Paul is saying it is important for us to look after one another. No one else in this world knows what we go through because they're, in, in, a, in a loving way, they're not on the team. They're not in the family. They don't know the struggles that we deal with. Yeah, there are worldly struggles out there and those are things that we face all together. But nobody else in this world knows what fellow believers go through. As a follower of Jesus, you know what other followers of Jesus go through. And we have to be there for each other. We are called to serve each other. Jesus would even say this. He's talking to his disciples in John chapter 13. And by the way, in John chapter 14, he drops the bomb of, I'm leaving you. But just before this, in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, he says this. He's talking to his followers, his closest followers. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Jesus is saying, the way that you love each other in the family of faith is going to show the world that you belong to me. Yeah, you can do good deeds. You can serve the community. You can be a light in your school or, or in your workplace and all of that, and that's really, really great. But Jesus says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The way that we love each other, the way that we serve each other is going to show this lost, broken, and dying world the hope that we have in Jesus. Earlier, we had you think about one person or two, maybe two people that set an example for you. And, and you, you watched them he said, I want to be like them. I want to ask you this question. Who are you setting the example for? As a follower of Christ, who are you leading along to bring alongside you? Because we see in the scriptures that Paul brought Timothy, brought the Philippian church alongside him. We see this love for the gospel, this willingness to serve for the sake of the gospel, and this willingness to serve each other. So my question to you today is this, who are you leading to the gospel? Let's pray together.